Welcome to the fourth and final Medical Monday for Heart Month, February 2023. Today, my wonderful husband, Frank Jaworski, is in the studio with me, and we're going to talk about something fascinating and relevant to heart warriors and their families. The title of our episode today is, How Can You Do Heart Surgery Through a Hole in the Groin? Many of my longtime listeners probably already have some ideas of the things that we're going to talk about, but Frank, let's just go ahead and get into it. We know that many heart warriors, including our own child, have had to undergo heart procedures, such as an ablation of a dysrhythmia or arrhythmia. And I think maybe that's the first thing I want to ask you is, what's the difference between an arrhythmia and a dysrhythmia? Really, that's just a question of what word you like to use. Technically, arrhythmia means no rhythm but that could just means that your heart is beating in a non-rhythmic way. Dysrhythmia technically means a bad rhythm, but the words are interchangeable. Yeah, I figured they were synonyms, but I just thought I would throw that out there in case some of our listeners don't know that arrhythmia and dysrhythmia really are synonymous. Many heart warriors have undergone heart procedures for rhythm problems. And there are a number of different kinds of procedures. Our own heart warrior had arrhythmias or dysrhythmias, since those words are synonymous, and had to have a maze procedure. Now, can you tell us what a maze procedure or a modified maze procedure, which is what our heart warrior had, what that entails, Frank? Well, a maze procedure involves the attempt to control atrial fibrillation or atrial dysrhythmias by directly scarring the surface of the heart because scars don't transmit electricity. So with the chest open, usually for another procedure, they will actually create scarring on the surface of the heart, either using radio frequency ablation, which means you take a metal wire and touch it to that part of the heart tissue, and you send radio frequency energy through that, and it kills that little piece of the heart that it touches. So it creates a scar line there. Or they use cryoablation. They use liquid nitrogen in contact with the tissue that kills the tissue. Or they'll actually take a scalpel and actually make an incision into the surface of the heart in a pattern so that it creates, quote, a maze. It's not an acronym. It actually means a maze. Dad, so the, the signals won't be able to pass a through. Doctor. Nope. Oh uh, my goodness. I just didn't know that they actually made it look like a maze. See, you taught me something, Frank. So the thing to take away from this, though, is that a maze procedure happens when the heart is opened. Not but necessarily are... the heart. There's an open chest procedure where you open the chest to work on the heart. And an open heart procedure means you actually open the walls of the heart to work inside. So a maze okay. procedure technically is not an open heart procedure. Okay. Because you're it's working on the surface of the heart. Procedure. Right. But frequently it's they're done right. while the patient is in surgery for something else, which is an open heart procedure, right. and while they're on bypass, because it's easier to manipulate the heart muscle while they're on bypass. Right. And that's the case with our heart warrior, because she was having a Fontier revision, and they decided to seize that moment to go ahead and also try to take care of those rhythm issues. Right. So that's a big, scary, hairy deal, Right. Yes, absolutely. Isn't it a lot better to take care of those rhythm problems in a catheterization lab? Absolutely. The electrophysiology lab, which is a specific kind of cath lab that is created to treat rhythm problems, they do essentially the same thing. If you want to think of it this way, if you're doing an atrial fibrillation ablation via a maze procedure, you're working on the heart wall by touching it or affecting it or scarring it from the outside. When you do it with a catheter, you are touching it or scarring it from the inside, but it's the same tissue that you're treating. So the catheter for an ablation, which has an effect like a maze procedure, is passed in through the patient's groin. They access the femoral artery or the femoral vein and pass a catheter up the body from the, the femoral vein to the vena cava and then up into the atrium through the inferior vena cava. And there they can do an ablation. I just thought of this. Ablation in an engineering term means like you're grinding away something or, or wearing away something. 
In this case, it means you're actually intentionally killing the tissue in a very small line because the heart's wiring is embedded in the heart muscle. It's not right. separate. It right. grows in there naturally. And so in order to disrupt the wiring and change the rhythm patterns, you have to actually damage the tissue along the parts where that signal was transmitted. Fascinating. But the big advantage to me of doing a heart surgery through a hole in the groin versus actually opening the chest is that you should have a fast recovery period, hopefully less opportunities for infections, and it just seems less scary. Am I right? Absolutely. Absolutely. First of all, if you're going to have an open chest procedure, you're going to spend a week in the hospital at the least. But if you're doing a transcatheter procedure, an ablation through an opening in the groin, people go home the same day. Isn't that amazing? Even people with congenital heart defects, they would still go home the same day? That could be very specific to the individual because the circulation is very different with congenital heart patients versus non-congenital heart patients. People that have had the Fontan procedure have different anatomy inside their atria. So where the catheter gets passed and what kind of pathways it has to make may differ. And so right. it might require you to stay overnight, but usually not mm -hmm. more than overnight. Which is still a lot better than a whole week or even a longer. A lot better. Absolutely. Yeah. Because another thing that we know with our own child having had three open heart procedures is that when it is an open heart procedure, they frequently have pleural effusions. Sometimes they can get air in their chest. There's so many more opportunities for complications. Absolutely. Because essentially, if you're doing a transcatheter procedure, you're going directly through the inside of the heart to the part you want to work on. But if you're going through the chest wall, you have to open the chest wall and push aside the lungs and do all that kind of thing and possibly go on bypass also. So many more interventions that could possibly have side effects and problems. Right. And they would have to have anesthesia. When you have an ablation, do you also have anesthesia? It depends on the kind of ablation that you have. I'm a nurse anesthetist, and I do work a lot in the electrophysiology lab. A lot of the ablations that we do, we can use just sedation. We'll give IV medications that will make you sleepy. Actually, it'll look like you are asleep if someone were to see you in the lab. And from your point of view as the patient, you close your eyes, you drift off, you wake up, and we're done. So it's like being asleep. We'll use a deep sedation and just oxygen they breathe. Sometimes we have to do a general anesthetic. And a lot of that has to do with exactly where in the heart we're working. Okay, so here's the question that I don't want to ask, but I have to. I've heard of cases where heart warriors have had an ablation, but it doesn't get rid of the arrhythmia or just rhythmia. Why is that? Well, there are a variety of reasons. First of all, an ablation is not a quick procedure. It isn't where you put the catheter inside, find the spot, push the button, and we're done. Frequently, they have to spend time mapping the pathways. They actually place catheters against different parts of the inside of the heart and read the signals that come out so they can tell where the wiring is because it's not marked. If you right. look inside the heart, there isn't clear pathways that say this is where the atrial wire is. So you have to map it out. That takes time, and the actual intervention takes time because you have to ablate an area, burn an area, as they say, and then see what happens, and then burn an area next to it and see what happens. And you create patterns of ablation inside the heart wall, and knowing when you've got it effectively done can take a while. Sometimes it takes so long that you don't want to try to get everything done in one procedure. You'll actually wake a patient up, bring them back a week or two later, and try again. Another reason why it happens that you don't always get things fixed is because in the process of doing the ablation, the injury that you cause causes the inflammation of the heart muscle. So mm. you may finish the procedure and it looks like the dysrhythmia is gone based right. on your testing intraoperatively. And then a few weeks later, when the swelling goes down, the inflammation goes down, the dysrhythmia may come back. And so in that case, you'll have to come back. Okay. So I've actually had some friends who have had multiple ablations and Maybe they would work for a little while and then they would stop working. What is the next step if you have multiple ablations and they just can't seem to get rid of the dysrhythmias? It's very common if you have rhythm problems that one of the earliest steps will be some kind of medication they can use to treat you. It's a progression, like you're saying. If yeah, they try but usually they try the medication before they do an ablation. Absolutely. Yeah. So if they've tried the medication and it's not working, they can try doing, for some dysrhythmias like atrial fibrillation, they can give you a medication that'll help to control your rhythm and then do a cardioversion. They can give you a shock, a transthoracic shock, 
you know, you see it in TV shows all the time. They put the paddles on a person's chest and pull the trigger. Same kind of thing and shock yeah. it back into a normal rhythm. And depending on the medications they give, it might effectively convert it permanently back to a good rhythm. If that doesn't work, they might go ahead and try an ablation like we're talking about. There are different kinds of ablations. They can try a cryoablation where they use cold. They can try a radiofrequency ablation. Now, if they wouldn't use a cryoablation intervention in a cath lab, though, that would have to be open chest, right? No, actually, they do. Do they? Actually, they, actually wow. they do. Because, yeah, because the area that they're ablating is where the pulmonary veins come into the atrium. And so they create a ring of ablation around that area, around the entry point for those vessels. So instead of taking that wire and going burn and making a little ring of dots where they're all connected, what they can actually do is take a catheter that has a balloon on the end of it that can withstand the application of liquid nitrogen. They put the balloon inside the atrium and inflate it with liquid nitrogen. So the surface of the balloon is incredibly cold. It's cold enough to damage the tissue. But they press the balloon up against the opening of that vessel, and it basically creates one big burn simultaneously all the way around. And that would be a lot faster. It can be a lot faster, and it can be effective. It Again, it depends on the formation of the rhythm itself, which way they'll choose to go, and on the patient's condition also. But if they've tried ablation and they can't fix it, again, it depends on what it is. There are ventricular dysrhythmias that if they're treated effectively, that's great. And if they can't be treated effectively, they can put in an implantable cardiac defibrillator. Right. So that if you do develop VTAC or whatever it is, the machine can shock you out of it. They can also intentionally disrupt the conduction entirely and place a pacemaker. So they take over the simulation of the patient's heart. And one of the later steps they can use to help treat atrial fibrillation if ablations don't work and nothing else works, then you have to think about the fact that this patient has atrial fibrillation, which can tend to produce blood clots that will go to your brain, your lungs, your kidneys. Very dangerous. They can kill you. So how can you treat a patient? Well, they give you a blood thinner. But the problem with giving you a blood thinner is that if you have blood thinners on board, a simple fall, a simple bump on your head can kill you because it can cause bleeding in your brain because of the blood thinners. Yeah, that's so. Scary. So one of the later stage treatments you'll see is called an atrial appendage occluding device. The left atrial appendage, where the left atrium takes the blood and it goes from your lungs to your left ventricle and out into your body, there is an appendage. It's a, like a sack of tissue on one side that is, it's there because your body creates it as part of the formation of the heart in utero. It doesn't really have a use after you're born, but it is the place where clots form because of the circulation of the blood in that area if you have atrial fibrillation. So one of the safest things they can do if you're on blood thinners is to place a device inside that appendage. Is that what a Watchman is? Watchman is one brand. There's one brand of an atrial appendage occluding device. There's another brand called Amulet made by a different company, and I'm not sure which companies make them or if there are more out there, but They all do the same function, and that is a device made of nitinol wire that goes inside that space. They expand it. It fills it up and prevents clots from being tossed out of that appendage, out of the circulation, hurting you. After they place an atrial appendage occluding device, they can decrease or eliminate your blood thinners so that you're less at risk for injury or death from a simple fall. And are pacemakers also used when ablations aren't successful for dysrhythmias? Yes, pacemakers are used. There are things they can do. They can take over the beating of your heart if there's no effective rhythm, or they can overdrive pace if you go into an atrial fibrillation or another rapid rhythm, rapid dysrhythmia. They can pace very quickly, and it'll drive you out of that rhythm by putting you back into a normal atrial and ventricular rhythm where you have a normal coordination of the two chambers of the heart. Night Forever by the Baby Blue Sound Collective. I think what I love so much about this CD is that some of the songs were inspired by the patients. Many listeners will understand many of the different songs and what they've been inspired by. Our new album will be available on iTunes, Amazon.com, Spotify. I love the fact that the proceeds from this CD are actually going to help those with congenital heart defects. Enjoy the music. Home Tonight Forever. Thank you. 
This content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The opinions expressed in the podcast are not those of Hearts Unite the Globe, but of the hosts and guests, and are intended to spark discussion about issues pertaining to congenital heart disease or bereavement. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Anna. If you have a question or comment that you would like addressed on our show, please send an email to Anna Jaworski at Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. That's Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. Now, back to Heart to Heart with Anna. Well, thank you so much for explaining about one of the ways that interventional cardiologists can create a hole in the groin and put a catheter into a person's heart to solve some dysrhythmias. But there's another kind of heart surgery that can be done through a hole in the groin, Frank. And I'm wondering if you can tell us about your experience with transcatheter cardiac procedures. I don't have a lot of experience in terms of providing anesthesia for transcatheter valve placement. I did work as an intensive care nurse back in the 1990s and took care of a lot of patients post-operatively after having had an open chest procedure, an open heart procedure for replacement of a valve. And those surgeries, that's a big, hairy deal. When you see somebody Mm -hmm. who has their chest open and their heart open, and they have the artificial valve in place, and they're sewing it in, there's literally a ring of about 30 or 40 sutures around the outside of that valve. And so Mm. it's an odd picture. You're seeing down into the open heart, And the valve is sitting there, the prosthetic valve with a plastic placement device that holds it in position while it's being sewn in. And the sutures that are sewn through the cuff of the valve, they hang out of the wound and they're basically arrayed in all directions. It looks like there's the streamers of suture out in all directions. And the surgeon goes back and takes each one one at a time and sews it into the heart muscle, then cuts them off and then it goes from there. It's fairly involved surgery. Now, I mention this because going from that to a transcatheter placement of a valve is enormously different. Sure. Yeah. It sounds like the way that they have to do an open heart is really scary, Frank. It's tedious and a little scary. The surgeons are very good at this. They do this all the time. And so the technical part of it is, to be honest, boring. Because Well, when you're doing the anesthesia and the patient's on bypass, there's not much for us to do but watch. Because the blood flow and circulation are controlled by the perfusionist. So the anesthetist just gets to watch. But one of the major differences between doing an open heart procedure for a valve replacement and doing a transcatheter procedure is when you do a transcatheter procedure, you don't take out the old valve. When you do an open chest procedure, you actually excise surgically. You cut out the old valve and sew the new valve into the place where it was before. There's no way to pull a valve out with a catheter device. So if you don't have to pull the valve out, to replace it via catheter, why would you have to pull it out if you're doing open chest? Because relative risk. Also, when you place a valve with an open heart procedure, you're actually sewing it into position. You open the chamber of the heart above the valve, you place the valve in position, and you sew it in place. Like anything else, if you were sewing a zipper into a garment, doing craft work at home, you would place little stitches, usually with a machine or by hand, all up and down the sides of the zipper to hold it in place. You place little sutures all around the valve to hold it in place. There's no way to leave the old valve in place and place the new valve with this because of the way the valve is deployed. The valve you sew in surgically is a completely formed and shaped valve that fits exactly where the old one used to be, so you can't place it with the old one in place. The transcatheter-placed valve is a special case. Okay. So when you place the catheter into the vessel, let's say it's an aortic valve, one of the more commonly replaced valves, the valve structure is relatively fragile. It can be pushed around. It can be damaged relatively easily. It can be broken. So what you do is you intentionally push it out of the way. So they place the catheter through the valve. They place the basically folded up, carefully packaged valve on the catheter directly inside of the existing valve. Then when they inflate a balloon, that expands the new valve, it basically crushes the old valve against the wall of the vessel. And it has structures built into the new valve that pin the new valve in place. It holds it in there like little metal prongs. So when you do that, what you now have is the aorta with the crushed remnants, as it were, of the old valve on the outside and the new valve in place. 
This is not always a simple procedure. One of the major problems they have after the procedure is sometimes you have leakage around the edge of the new valve. You'll have passage of blood on the outside. That's not good because no. the old valve that you've crushed out of the way is no longer a competent valve in any way. It's been crushed out of the way. Right. And the whole purpose of a valve in the heart is to let the blood go one way but not the other. Right, because otherwise you have regurgitation. Exactly. Exactly. And that's an yeah. opportunity for, for clots a lot of to bad happen. Things. And yeah, lots of It also means you don't get as efficient pumping because some of the blood flow right. back. Right. For me, the thing that's scary, especially when you're talking about the aortic valve, there's an awful lot of blood volume that goes through that aortic valve. And I yes. would not want the pumping of the blood through that valve to cause the new valve to get pushed along inside the artery. There's a lot of blood flow. There's a lot of pressure against that valve. And you're absolutely right. And this is one of the major things they worry about is about the valve becoming malpositioned or loose, as it were. Now, it's not going to flow downstream for a variety of reasons. For one thing, blood vessels, as they come out of the heart and come out of the body, the arteries only get smaller. They subdivide and get smaller and smaller. So it's not going to travel downstream very far. But even right. moving a millimeter okay. or two is outside of what you want it to do. So right. when they're actually placing these valves, when they're placing any kind of device inside the heart via a catheter, what they'll do is they'll get it in position. They'll use ultrasound to help visualize it. They'll put a transesophageal echocardiogram probe down the patient's esophagus, and they have another cardiologist whose job is just to watch the ultrasound. Wow. So there's and two cardiologists in Two or the... three sometimes. Really? And they'll also be watching the x-ray. They'll have the fluoroscope on. So that when they actually place the valve and see how it pushes other things out of the way and seats itself, as it uh -huh. were, inside the vessel, then they will do a trial release where they'll sure. back off a little bit on the connection to the valve and see if it moves. And that makes perfect sense. Yeah, exactly. Then once they're sure it's in the right position, they'll go ahead and release it entirely and the valve is on its own, but now it's attached. So how long does it take to do something like that? It sounds really complicated, but I would imagine you don't want to spend much time in there. It's been a long time since I've participated in one of these. They don't take as long as they used to. I would say an hour to two hours, the actual wow. procedure. And of course, the recovery time is faster than a surgery. Unlike with ablations, where you might conceivably go home the same day, that's not going to happen for a valve. They'll keep you for a day or two at least for yeah. a variety of reasons. Even when it's done transcatheter, they'll still keep Even you when it's done transcatheter because they're going to keep a darn close eye on you. And sure. also they're going to start you on blood thinners within 24 hours or so because they don't want clots to form on the new valve. So they'll put you on blood thinners and they'll assess your blood and they'll see how well the blood thinners are working. Okay. So let me ask you a question. Yes. I've had friends who have been told, oh, you need to have a valve replacement. What kind of valve do you want? And they're given a choice of a mechanical valve, a porcine valve, a bovine valve. I'm amazed at the quantity of different kinds of valves that are available. But I can't imagine a mechanical valve being able to fit inside a catheter. Are you only able to do transcatheter valve replacements with certain types of valves? No, actually, there are at least four companies that make catheter-delivered valve systems. And some of them do use biological prosthetics made from animal tissue. And some of them do use purely mechanical created valves. Really? The, uh, okay. Yeah. But you got to understand that when I say it's delivered by catheter, the wire that's the finder that goes inside the vessel first, basically track to put it where you want it to be, that's by okay. far the smallest part of the, of the procedure. There also has to be the much thicker catheter. It's a tube that contains the device. And think of it as layers, like a sandwich. There's going to be a wire that goes in initially. There's a catheter that goes in around that. Basically, the wire passes through it that contains the balloon that expands the valve. And okay. that balloon goes in, and of course, it's initially completely collapsed. It's as thin as it can possibly be. Right. The valve, also a pre-deployment mode where it's still very tight. Think of it as a long, skinny cylinder, okay, mm -hmm. is wrapped around that balloon. And around that is a sleeve, okay, that okay. holds the whole thing in place. So once right. they get it in position to where they want it, they retract the sleeve, they inflate the balloon, and it pushes the valve out into its full size and shape. So I guess they can use a variety of valves. So here's my last question. All right. So one of the big hairy deals with having any kind of catheterization put into your groin is that it used to take a long time of holding pressure 
on the groin after the catheterization is removed and patients like our kid used to just have to lay there. I think it was like six hours that they had to lay there with that pressure on their groin. I understand there are now new devices that can be used or some new kind of medication to help simplify this process. Can you tell me about that? Absolutely. And what I've witnessed of this comes from my experience working in the electrophysiology lab. Our daughter, Hope, had her procedure done in the mid-90s. That's when I worked in the intensive care unit and saw patients coming back from cath lab or EP lab. And they did have to have pressure held in their groins for hours at a time. And you're right, technology has improved since then. So what they have now is different kinds of closure devices that are actually placed by the cardiologist as they're pulling the catheters out of the groin. And what they do is they allow you to seal the vessel. Now, it's not perfect. You still have to lay still for a period of time afterwards, but they don't have to bear down on you and put pressure on it for hours at a time, which is uncomfortable and awkward and painful. And also, it takes less time. The longest time I've seen somebody have to wait after a procedure is about three hours. And I've seen it as low as an hour and a half to two hours before. So wow. it's much less time you have to spend laying still. I read an article about this somewhere. I can't even remember where. I think it was on one of the groups that I belong to in LinkedIn. And it almost seemed like it was super glue. I, I don't know. Is that crazy? No, <laughs> that's not crazy, but it's not exactly super glue. It's more like they use natural clotting factors and materials that work with the body so that you're basically speeding up the process to form a clot and an obstruction to bleeding for that site right there. Although the, you shouldn't be laughing because super glue is used surgically for a lot of things. Is it really? Oh, yes, absolutely. The kind of glue they use in surgery is not exactly the same formulation as what you buy at the hardware store. Right. But they do use a version of that kind of glue. The chemical variety is called cyanoacrylate. They do use a version of super glue for things like closing wounds. Because a lot of times, I mean, you want to close a wound that's going to be under a lot of tension. The patient's moving around for days and weeks afterwards. They'll suture. And then at the very last, they'll put a thin layer of super glue on top of that. And what that does is it allows the skin to stay approximated, to stay lined up properly so that it heals well. Then over normal processes, over time, your skin sloughs off cells and the superglue peels off and it comes off. But the superglue is used. It's not exactly superglue they use for these devices. I can't think of the brand names of the devices they use in the EP lab where I work, but they definitely do have devices that leave in place. And it's a bit of a process placing one. But the representatives for the companies are very good at teaching the doctors how to do that. Interventional cardiology has come a long way since you yes. started nursing and since our child was born. It's amazing to me. Just in the last 10 years, really, there have been so many improvements in medical technology that makes it easier on the patient and on the surgeon and the nurses, too, having yes, to take absolutely. care of these patients. It really is quite fantastic. Yeah. and. How lovely that we can do heart surgery through the groin instead of through the chest and have well, much better outcomes for so many patients. And it's interesting that you mentioned that about going through the groin because one of the things I wanted to say is there are some procedures and some devices that can be placed via different accesses in this. Now, w one of the nice ones is that they can occasionally go in through a radial artery or an axillary artery. So they're going in through your wrist or your arm. And that way, after the procedure, they can put a nice pressure dressing on there you can get up and walk around an hour after the procedure because it's not going through your groin. That's a lot wow. easier. And yeah. there, there are some kinds of valve replacements that are not done through the groin. Sometimes the aortic valve will be replaced by actually making a small incision in the chest just below the rib cage and actually putting the catheter directly into the apex of the heart. Uh, okay, that sounds a little scary. That is more like a traditional heart surgery, although you don't have to crack open the chest to do it. You're basically going through the soft tissue. That does involve a general anesthetic. The patient does go all the way to sleep. I would definitely need to be all the way to sleep for that. <laughs> and another thing to be aware of also is that whereas in the past 10 years ago or more, doing the transcatheter placement of aortic valves was done in the cath lab, frequently now it's done in the operating room. And the reason for that is that there are occasions where they have to progress rapidly to doing a traditional open chest procedure. If any problems develop, any concerns, you were talking about not having good positioning on the valve. So if you're trying to place one of these valves and you get it in there and they won't seat right, now you've got yourself committed because you can't just back off yeah. with that mechanical valve 
have the old valve that you crushed out of the way take over and work again because it won't do it anymore. And they will sometimes have to go very quickly to an open chest procedure. So instead of having to haul the patient upstairs, they start out in the operating room. So if they have to go on bypass, they can. That makes a lot of sense. And it allows you to expedite anything that needs to be done. Plus, you've got all of the equipment that you need right there. You're not having to transfer the patient exactly. or transfer the medical equipment that you might need. So, yeah, that just makes a lot of sense. So, Frank, as a nurse and as a heart dad, do you have any words of advice or words of wisdom for my listeners regarding these heart procedures that can be done through catheterization? No. Uh, what I would say is that I'm a human being too, and I may have to have one of these done someday. And because of that, I'm very glad of the research and the advances in technology that we have. And if I or anybody I knew or was related to had to have one, I would feel pretty confident that the technology is very mature and they're doing a really good job of making these work. I have talked to patients who have had a transcatheter valve placed and they said that compared to people they had talked to had had an open chest procedure, it was night and day. It was two entirely different things. And anytime you can do as good a procedure with lower risk, lower hospitalization, less pain, less blood, those are all good things. I think so, too. Thank you so much for coming on the program today, Frank, and for explaining about these procedures to me and my listeners. It's always a pleasure to work with you, Anna. Well, friends, that does conclude this last Medical Monday episode of Heart to Heart with Anna for Heart Month, February 2023. Thanks for listening today. I hope you've enjoyed this Medical Monday mini-series for Heart Month 2023. That's all for now. And remember, my friends, you are not alone. Thank you again for joining us this week. We hope you have become inspired and empowered to become an advocate for the congenital heart community. Heart to Heart with Anna with your host, Anna Jaworski, can be heard at any time wherever you get your podcasts. A new episode is released every Tuesday from noon Eastern time.